Welcome to this time of worship. I think the weather has uh, left a few people at home. And we're hoping that the weather is not bad enough that uh, Dustin can get back from Franklin. They're having a conference at Seneca Hills, and he hoped to be back here by noon so we can still have the congregational meeting. We also noticed that uh, in the bulletin that the gentleman who was going to <clears throat> be here today and giving the, the presentation about the needs at uh, Sierra Leone, he is not here, obviously, and uh, because of a conflict of schedule. Reminder that there is a congregational meeting in, after the service. Uh, we'll gather downstairs. There is crackers and cheese to get us ready for the meeting. Also a reminder that uh, it's not in the bulletin today, but uh, next week there will be ordination and installation of the new officers. Are there any other announcements that anybody can think of that needs to be said at this time? So let us proceed with the call to worship. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and he trembles, who touches the mountains and they smile. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Please stand for the invocation of our Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, Holy God, we thank you for the many blessings that you have showered upon our lives. We thank you for the opportunity which is ours in this country to gather here this morning and worship you. We seek your presence, your comfort, your guidance. We come to worship and adore you. We come to confess, to sing, to praise, and give thanks. We ask that you continue to watch over us, be with us now as we say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Join in the confession. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Take a moment for a silent prayer. You shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall call for help, and God will say, Here I am. The Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your needs in the parched places, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now that we have been forgiven, we have peace with God and with each other. Share a sign of peace with your forgiven brothers and sisters in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
when you come back together, would you kind of join in the center? Make it a little easier for the choir and for each one as they move around.
children are now the vows of the new church. We don't have a message this morning.
Okay. okay, I have a phrase concerning our trip last weekend to Pigeon Forge. It went well and enjoyed it immensely. You know, it's strange that I have you on the, <coughs> the list here to come up and give us a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. <laughs>
um, area we had to stop, but praise the Lord, we were right by an exit so we could get off and do a little detour around there. Um, but it was wonderful to be with the three youth. Um, I could count Tim as a youth. And um, Juliana went and Celeste. And we had a good time of uh, fellowship. There was like 10,000 kids that were there with us in Pigeon Forge. Um, so the town was hopping. <laughs> um, I'll let Steve talk a little bit. What struck me is, is at the end. So I'll let him tell you what he wants to tell you. And then I'll tell you about the end, OK? okay. All right. Um, the conference this year, the theme for it was explicit with X, not EX, okay, explicit, no room for doubt. And um, I have to admit that there was a lot to do, or a lot of notes were taken, but the one thing that really affected me is the one I would like to share with you. And it was on uh, Sunday night, uh, the speaker that gave uh, his points that he wanted to drive home before they gave the uh, altar call that night. And I want to share that with you, so bear with me, because I'm going to try to cover a lot of territory, and we're going to start, we're going to be in the book of Acts, okay? We're going to go through the first seven chapters. All right, number one, first of all, it starts out with Jesus Christ ascends into heaven after being on earth 40 days after his resurrection, and he says, wait until uh, the Holy Spirit comes. He says, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to the people. And that was on Pentecost, which would have been 10 days later. And Pentecost was a feast that the Jewish people were required to come into Jerusalem for. It was one of three feasts, okay? And at that time, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit came on the people. Many, many people became believers. The church was beginning to grow rapidly, very rapidly. At one point, there was 3,000 one day said yes to Jesus Christ. Okay, and then fast forwarding, as they were growing, um, some of the people had possessions. We're selling them, bringing the money to the church so that they could provide for the people that had needs. And that takes us up to a couple of believers, a husband and a wife, Ananias and Sapphira. Have you heard them, heard them before? Okay. Ananias and Sapphira have some property. And they said, we will sell the property and give the proceeds to the people of the church. And I don't understand exactly what happened, but it does say in Scripture that they conspired that uh, between themselves that they would hold back some of this. And I'm going to try to envision what may have occurred. I'm going to guess that maybe they had a hot piece of property that they thought <laughs> that they thought might only fetch so many dollars. So they probably said, "Well, we know uh, somebody else gave some money, so I'm sure we can give that much. We're going to let everybody know this is what we're going to give." Well, maybe they had a bidding war for the property. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Got way more than anticipated. But they had told God that we were going to give it to you. We're going to sell this property and give it to you. But in the meantime, they get more than they thought. And they thought, well, we'll just keep back the extra. So anyways, Ananias goes to Peter with the money and gives it to him. And Peter says, is this all there is? And he says, yes, it is. And he says, why are you lying to God, Ananias? And he drops over dead. Okay, I can't imagine that happening because I'm sure that if I know for myself, I would probably not be standing here today because I have made promises to God and have not kept them. Okay. So, three hours later, Sapphira shows up. And she doesn't know that anything's happened. Peter questions her. He says, is this, uh, is this how much you got for what you sold? And she says, oh yes, this is what we got. And he says, why are you lying to God? And she too passes away. But before they both passed, it, Peter made it very clear. He says, you could have done whatever you wanted with that money. You didn't have to give it all to us, and if you just said that, everything would been fine, but you lied to God, okay? So again, two believers, okay? Now, uh, we have a situation where there's so many people that are believers, we have widows and children, okay? And we're moving along in the chap between chapter 5 and 6, and they decide they need some people to deal with uh, taking care of the needs of the widows, and we have seven people selected, which I'm going to call deacons. It's not used at that time, but that's what I envision them as. And Stephen was one of them. He said he was full of spirit and wisdom. Okay, and you also have to keep in mind that we have a lot of people who are not believers. And they are concerned about what's going on here. Okay, and so Stephen, they approach Stephen, and they talk with him, and they're amazed at his knowledge and wisdom. But yet they're very, uh, they don't like what he's saying about Jesus. And they decide that we have to come up with some 
false accusations against him, that he's uh, saying bad things about Moses and God. They force him to come before the council, very similar to what Jesus faced. Okay, And it says in Acts 6.15, that as they sat him in front of the council, they said they saw his face like the face of an angel, which meant that he had a calm, unruffled composure, reflecting the presence of God. So even under the circumstances he was facing, he was very calm, relaxed, and they asked him, are these accusations true? And if you know anything about your scripture, he goes into a very long spiel about uh, going all the way back from Abraham, telling about how God promised the Israelites, told that they'd be in slavery for 400 years, they'd be delivered from that. Moses delivered them. Uh, he was like a redeemer at the time. But Moses also said, there's one greater than me who is coming. And these people, being of their faith and of being of Jewish heritage, if they would have known their scripture, they would, should have been able to recognize who Jesus Christ was. Okay, so he gets done with that. And he looks up. I want you to vision this. Scripture in Acts 6, uh, verse 7, 56. And this is the one that really spoke to me. Was It said that Stephen then looked up and he got done speaking. He saw heaven open. He says, look, he says, I see heaven opening, I see Jesus standing next to God. And the speaker said, what's so unique about that is everywhere else in Scripture, when they speak of Jesus in the presence of God, he's always seated. <coughs> okay. And he went on to say that he envisioned that moment as Christ standing up and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. But Stephen stood firm in his belief, did not waver whatsoever. And a few verses later, they got so mad when he said that, they said they grabbed him, took him outside of town, began to stone him. And he said, Lord, receive my spirit, drop to his knees, and Father, forgive them. And then he died. So we have an example of three different believers at this time. And there's no doubt in my mind, the one that would fit the theme of explicit would be Stephen. And I guess my desire is I hope that my life will begin to be explicit. There will be no room for doubt about who I serve. And I hope that becomes yours too. So. <coughs> um, go along with that, the same night um, they had the invitation. And like I said, there was 10,000 youth <coughs> adults in, the, in this one room. And so there was like 50 bends around the room. And they had three colored stones. They had a black stone, a red stone, and a white stone. And you were supposed to go one by one. You'd go to the bin, and they had a, a line so nobody could see what, which one you chose. And you go to the bin, and you'd pick out which one. You had to be honest with God and pick out the stone that you thought represented your life. Um, the black one, of course, was that you were a sinner and that you had a lot of sin in your life. The red, you knew Jesus but you still had some sin that was controlling you, that you hadn't given your total life over to him. And the white one was that you were a believer and that you believed in Jesus. Um, so it took like, they said 28 minutes was pretty really bad for that, that big a crowd. But we all um, selected our stone, and it was very meaningful to me to get real with God and to really decide where I am in my life. Um, so that was a real good moment then. Um, and then when we left on Monday, they had a closing, and at the end, they had bigger stones. Um, they were white, and they wanted all the youth group leaders to go back and the kids to watch what they, which, if they took a, a white stone, that, you, that they were accountable to you, um, and that you were accountable to them um, to help them through their life um, living for Christ. So it was just kind of neat to see the differences and to get, Real with Christ again. So that was my
think is deep. Yeah, I know that uh, I've been to a couple conferences. That they can be very stimulating, very opening, very meaningful. Um, <clears throat> I'm quite sure that we'll hear that some more of that next week from those who are at Seneca Hills at this moment or on their way back. Um, <clears throat> the clock on the wall says we still got 23 minutes. And I'm not going to preach. <clears throat> but I'm going to ask Robin if she would come up and uh, spend some time. Each of you are going to be asked to come up with a hymn that you'd like to have uh, us all sing. So I'm going to turn over to Robin and she'll be your song leader. So we have 20 minutes. Be thinking about your favorite hymn, and I'd like to join you in singing it. So we'll start over here with this section. You all have a favorite hymn that you'd like to sing this morning? 92. 92. Hymn number 92. Oh, how I love Jesus. Yeah. 
342. Rock of Ages, number 342. Can we sing all three verses? Yes, thank you.